Sunken Isles has less than 10 days left to go. I'm running out of ways to describe the adventure, but I am really proud of it, and if the promise of an eldritch island adventure sounds fun to you, I'd appreciate if you back the Kickstarter. Going into the adventure, we had two main focuses, the diversity of each island's features and its inhabitants, and all the different ways that the party can change their future as they travel through the pachinko-style timeline. That was one focus. The other is the diversity of the adversaries. At the same time as the party rushes through the Isles, three different forces are working toward their own ends. The undead Norse Dwarven King, his New Age pirate friend and ancient sorceress, the spirit of an island and the eternal magic forces it works with, and the creator deity and all its eldritch flesh aliens. There's a lot more info about the whole project on the Kickstarter, so give it a couple minutes of your time and a few pennies if you can. Thanks for the support, and here's some snakes. Welcome to a video about Nagas, one of the weirdest translations of cosmology into D&D I've seen in a while. The Naga is naturally a bit confusing to understand, since it's a half-divine, half-snake, half-person type of creature from Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism. They also have a bunch of forms in addition to regular snakes, like half-snake people who aren't Yuan-Ti, or the coolest form I've ever seen which is just a person but with a halo of snakes. It seems like they're pretty consistently denizens of the underworld who guard a buttload of precious items and materials. But that's the end of my research because if I go any further I know I'll just be wrong. Let's jump into the kind of naga you can fight and kill with words and small rocks. 30 trillion years ago, in a legendary historic period where magic was 10 times as powerful but nobody had paper so they didn't write anything down, a race of humanoids rolled some play-doh into immortal snakes and then died. Yeah, they were able to make snakes that could never die, but died before they invented history. Don't even know what killed them. Could have been anything from alien invaders to a corn famine. So now the snakes took over because nobody was around, they're packed with magic, and a few adventurers show up every decade to steal stuff. In addition to Tomb Raiders, Nagas do have one other long-running rival that you'll never expect. But I'll give you some choices anyway. Do Big Snake fight Big Bird? Big Bird Snake? Snoltists, Hydra, or the biggest snake. Real quick, in Cambodia and other areas it's depicted to just be a snake with several heads, and the Lernian Hydra looks exactly the same. So either mutated snakes made really popular stories, or there's something there. Oh, the answer was Snoltists. Because of the mythical overlap of body types and snake superiority, they clash pretty often. If the lack of definition so far is confusing you, that's okay because it gets a little bit worse. We have two primary types of Nagas who more or less function the same, but one is super duper evil and one will kiss you on the cheek. There's also a third one that doesn't really matter called a Bone Naga, which is what happens when a bunch of small snake people surround a Naga, chant really really fast, and delete its skin before it can use its immortality. What's confusing is that this, the weakest of the Naga, which arguably could be under skeletons, is the first alphabetically and it's the only one on the page where you read about the other two. Okay, Guardian Nagas. Described as smart, cool, and sexy, these big snakes with chiseled jaws protect powerful shit that's best left collecting dust forever. The coolest thing about them is that they almost never actually fight people. They'll do their best to warn people about their treasure's danger or redirect them to something less dangerous nearby. Guardian Nagas are borderline celestials, they even speak the language and have a bunch of cleric spells. They spend most of their time researching magic, thwarting the rise of super evil bad guys, or hanging out with the locals. Yeah, since they're immune to time, they don't really mind when a civilization pops up around them now and again. The ruins that you find a Naga in might not even be the one that it's from. Also, these guys probably deal with a lot of dimensional enemies. Like, how often do you think that they fight Yugoloths? Once every couple hours? Where the Guardian Naga rules with peaceful wisdom, the Spirit Naga rules by biting people into submission. Since they're evil aligned, naturally we have a different word for their subjects that I'm exhausted by. Spirit Nagas hoard magic items and spells not to keep them secret, but to use them as much as possible. By far the coolest thing about them is that they are spell inventors. Their stat block has basic damage and curse spells, but if you want to introduce new spells to your campaign, place them in a book behind a big evil snake. But there's a catch. The way that Nagas are invincible, which I should have explained earlier, is through a more powerful version of a Lich's rejuvenation. If you kill it, it will come back in six days or less. 
and it will remember that you killed it. The only thing in the multiverse that can kill a Naga is the Wish spell. So they have Sifu-style save files, but instead of them getting older, their opponent does. If you didn't know about that, and you killed a Spirit Naga because it's only challenge rating 8, you've just sealed your fate and the fates of everyone you love. I'd imagine you could quickly put together an adventure where a Spirit Naga works with a bunch of Yuanti to steal from a Guardian Naga. And then you could have the Yuanti pull a dick move card and create one or two new Bone Naga slaves and get a bunch of free magic. So if you're a strong adventurer, and you notice there's a big snake in them their ruins, consider it both a beacon and a death trap with some powerful shit tucked away. Because that's basically Nagas.